there we go. Hello and welcome to Torm Book Club. This is uh, the 12th of April, 2015. I am Saruman, your host, and as you can probably tell, I'm not exactly 100% healthy today. <laughs> uh, nor is my guest, uh, Nancy uh, Steinman, <laughs> who is a, a Torrent staffer and a contributor to our Book of the Month. Um, Middle Earth Madness. So uh, say hi, Nancy. You can see her up in the corner right there. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so uh, today we're uh, we're taking a little break from our uh, our long uh, discussion about uh, the Silmarillion to uh, talk about our book of the month from a month and a half ago, actually. <laughs> um, uh, Middle Earth Madness. Uh, I do apologize for uh, how congested I sound. Um, as the man says, the show must go on. So uh, I've uh, quarantined myself, so everybody is uh, chatting through Skype right now. <laughs> and by everybody, I mean, uh, I mean Nancy. Um, uh, Cliff, unfortunately, couldn't be with us uh, today because he had to work. Um, nor could uh, Kirsten, uh, Green Dragon, because she's uh, she she's working as well. Excuse me. <laughs> oh God, we'll be getting a lot of that today. <laughs> so we may be keeping this episode a little short, <laughs> um, but I did want to talk about. Um, I did want to at least do an, an episode, our episode about Middle Earth Madness, because it's been. Um, it's been a little uh, over a month and a half since uh, I announced it, and uh, I'm feeling bad about not doing this episode. So, I'm gonna power through this as sick as I am, and uh, we'll talk about it a bit. I, uh, the editor of uh, Middle Earth Madness, uh, J.W. Braun, uh, couldn't be with it. Um, he couldn't be with us uh, today because, uh, like everybody else, he has to work. Uh, for some reason, everybody's working on Sundays. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> it, it's a it's a very weird work schedule everybody has. <laughs> so, uh, but he did leave us um, a video message, uh, which I'd like to uh, play for all of you right now. Give me a second to set that up. Hi guys, I'm sorry I couldn't be there this afternoon, but I did want to tell you how much I love the OneRing.net book club. I watch the videos on YouTube all the time, and I'm well familiar with those of you out there like I Stole the One Ring, and Rovendeer, and Takio Temple, and Eva, and all the rest of you. And you guys are just so insightful that it's, it's an honor today to have you looking at Middle Earth Madness. And I also want to thank, of course, everybody who contributed to the project. Time. Uh, it was really Those of you out there, like I stole the one ring, brought together the Roven Deer, Takio Temple, Eva, and all the rest of you. Something like that. You guys are just so insightful. It, it's it's it an honor to, all the way back to have you looking at the 1980s when I was and uh, just I a little want to boy. Of course, everybody who contributed to the project. Uh, it was my cousin who was out there the like I stole the one ring. I loved her. Roman Deer, Takio Temple, and Eva, and all the rest of you. You guys are just so excited. And uh, I also want to thank, of course, everybody who contributed to the project. It was my cousin who was out there like I stole the one ring. Nancy? Yeah. Uh, I can hear this on your end, so it's creating um, Sorry. a feedback loop. Sorry. So I don't get to hear what he says, huh? Uh, <laughs> is there a way for you to uh, put in some headphones or something? No, that would be a good idea, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ugh. Technology, man. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, we're figuring it out, people. Chat is just spinning and spinning. Okay, are you good now? I can hear you. Okay. There, there's nothing else to hear yet. All right. Let's let's try this again. I'm sorry. This, I, I can't watch it and. Yeah, it, it's hard to watch the live stream while you're skyping with it. Should I not? Probably not. Okay. Let's try this again. again. Hi guys. I'm sorry I couldn't be there this afternoon, but I did want to tell you how much I love the OneRing.net book club. I watch the videos on YouTube all the time, and I'm well familiar with those of you out there like I Stole the One Ring and Rovendeer. Takio Temple and Eva and all the rest of you and you guys are just so insightful that it's it's an honor today to have you looking at Middle Earth Madness and I also want to thank of course everybody who contributed to the project uh, it was really it brought together a lot of different talented people and it was a privilege to be the editor of something like that and when I think about The Hobbit it takes me all the way back to the 1980s when I was uh, just a little boy and I read the book for the first time. In fact, it was my cousin who introduced it to me because I loved Dungeons and Dragons and he knew that. And he said, Justin, I went by Justin back then. He said, Justin, you have got to read The Hobbit. You love dragons so much, you're going to love this book. And he gave me his copy and I read it and I loved it. I moved on to the Lord of the Rings. I loved that. And then, of course, eventually, you get to the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movies. What's happening? And the OneRing.net comes about. And I started contributing to that website. And eventually, you have the Hobbit movies. And when those were coming out, I was talking to some of the other staff members. And we were, we were talking about the past books that we had done. And I said, well, you know, it would be really interesting if we did a book about the Hobbit movies. And there was some excitement about that. And so then we sort of put it together. And I thought that the best time to come out with a book about the movies would be just before the third movie came out. Because that way we could look back and ahead at the same time. Now that, of course, means that Middle Earth Madness only covers the first two Hobbit movies. And I know that can be a little frustrating. The good news about that is that, that leaves room for another book, more Middle Earth Madness, covering the third film. And when's that one going to come out? I don't know because I haven't started it. But I think one of these days I'm going to have to take a trip back to Middle Earth and finish this whole thing off. Until then, I want to tell you how much it's a privilege to be a part of the OneRing.net community and the fans of Tolkien, that community. Because, you know, like a lot of you, I'm fans of other things. I'm a big Star Wars fan, Star Trek fan, Robotech, Harry Potter, these things. I also like sports. But 
none of those communities are as kind and as generous and as loving hey, Josh. as the fans of Tolkien. Oh. And it just feels, okay. when I'm with you guys, <laughs> that there's such a sense of not just friendship, but a family of togetherness that it's, it makes me really proud to be first and foremost a fan of Tolkien. And I want to tell you how much I want to return that to you, how much I want you to know, how much I appreciate all that you guys represent. And I hope I represent some of that too. And uh, thank you so much for doing this today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So that was a JW Bronze message to all of us. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, so one one of the things he was talking about was uh, the idea that uh, there could be a second Middle Earth Madness book uh, since uh, this book doesn't cover the third movie, which. <clears throat> I'll be honest, was one of the things that uh, surprised me a little bit when I uh, first read it was like, okay, why is he, why are we doing a book about the Hobbit trilogy that's focusing only on the first two? Because I know that he was collecting everything and talking to everybody um, uh, and putting it all together after uh, the second movie, but before the third movie came out. And part of me was like, well, why don't you just wait until the third movie is out and then put them all together? And, but as he said, he, he wants to do a, a second book, which I think is a really cool idea. And yeah, who knows, I mean, maybe I can contribute to that one. <laughs> well, you definitely should. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot more to cover, um, yeah. with the third movie and everyone's feelings about the entire trilogy or, yeah. and I mean, I've talked about it at great length on the show, uh, how I feel about the third movie and the trilogy overall um which i won't get into again <laughs> i'll i'll write it down and send it to jw for the next book <laughs> <laughs> um but uh so nancy you made a contribution to this book didn't you uh yes i wrote uh the chapter about costuming and cosplay yes it's called a uh, middle earth fans dressing for the dressing part yeah um and it, it's a really nice, it's a really good piece, very well written. Oh, thanks. I, it's a little different than most of the other um, chapters in the book. It, it is, and I like that, because it's also a subject that we haven't really talked about too much on the show here, which is costuming and cosplay. And you talked a bit about uh, uh, the costume designers, uh, like Nyla Dixon in particular, and how she was... Uh, very nervous that uh, fans weren't going to like the designs that she came up with. Right. I, I guess it's very, um, you know, you're taking all these fans' visions of what they had in their heads for so many years and bringing it into reality. So there's always going to be some people who your vision doesn't match their vision. But um, I think everyone was really pleased. I mean, you know, fans just love those costumes. And one of the um, people that I interviewed, um, Maggie Allen from the Costumer's Guide website, um, she said that the Lord of the Rings and Star Wars were the one-two punch that really started people intensely into costuming, which I believe is true. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that because, like, um there's definitely a lot of uh, Star Wars uh, cosplay out there as well as uh, Lord of the Rings. Um, and, and there will be even more. <laughs> more that? Star Wars costuming soon. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> there's going to be even more. Uh, there's going to be more Star Wars cosplay pretty soon, isn't there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but because um, I've never been all that much into uh, cosplay myself. Uh, I don't know how much of it how much into it you've been, but have, like, have you noticed, um, any, any change in cosplay since, uh, like before and after 
Lord of the Rings and uh, the Star Wars prequels? Well, like, I, I think there was. I mean, I, I had been going to Comic-Con since before uh, the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh -huh. And I don't know whether I just became more aware of it. But once the Fellowship of the Ring happened, I think, I mean, cosplay just took off. I, I just got back from WonderCon, and the amount of costumes there was it was incredible. Yeah, yeah. I just saw um, Cliff and Justin were uh, putting up a bunch of pictures from uh, the barrel at WonderCon. Yeah, yeah. And all the different uh, people in costume uh, in the barrel was pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, and how like even people who are like dressed up as characters that are in no way associated with the Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings were still totally into like getting their picture in the barrel. Yeah, that people love the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, and even if they're into the other genre, they're still they loved it. And and there there actually wasn't that many Hobbit costumes this year, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, now that the last movie is done, uh, fandom will unfortunately start to, or the costuming will start to drift in other directions. That's how it usually goes. Yeah, I, I think there there will always be some, though. It's kind of classic. Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah for sure. And, uh, I mean, even, like, all the people who were dressed up at uh, the one last party, like, there were, some, there were some amazing costumes at the party. Yeah, that was great. And, and so many more than the earlier, like, the last two parties we had. Yeah, like, yeah, the last, the last couple of parties, it was more... There was there were costumers, but it felt like a lot of people preferred to sort of do formal attire. Right. And then for this party, people were like, screw it, I'm going in costume. Right. I, I think the remarkable thing is how um, comfortable people have become with costuming. How, like, I mean, I know we live in Los Angeles and Hollywood, but... Mm -hmm you can go to almost any event and there's people in costume now. Like people don't think twice about it. Like this is weird or, yeah. you know, what are people going to think? It's just become a foregone conclusion that people are going to costume. Yeah. It's, and, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and I love that. And I know that there's like some, some sort of blowback to that, especially at conventions where people sort of believe that there are certain people who believe that a lot of uh, cosplayers are doing it simply for the publicity of it rather than the love of costuming, which I don't totally agree with. I mean, I'm sure there are some people who are like that, but to put that much effort into something that you don't truly adore just doesn't right. make sense to me. Right. I mean, that's one of the things that I talk about in the article is how many underlying reasons there are that people cosplay mm -hmm. and that even if you start off with one reason you get pulled, like, let's say you just, oh my God, this costume is incredible. I want to re recreate it. Mm -hmm. And you do that, but then you get pulled into all the other aspects of it because people want to take your picture and then that makes you feel good. And, yeah. and, and you want to be part of the community and, and you see other people who are dressed in Lord of the Rings costumes and you want a picture together and then you want a picture with the actors. And so it kind of spirals and, and yeah, I, yeah. I, can, I can see that. I, but yeah, I mean, my point is, like, I don't think there are many people who go into costuming solely for the publicity aspect of it, like, right out of the gate. Like, I think a lot of a lot of customers are doing it because they really like that costume and they want to they wanna wear it. I, I think that's true. I think that's true. And uh, one of the costumes that you talked about in your article is being, like, one of the more popular ones in uh, Lord of the Rings uh, days was um, Arwen's dress, uh, the blood red Arwen dress. Yeah, I, I still see that everywhere. I mean, yeah. people, that's, that is so iconic, and, and I still see people making it and wearing it. Yeah, I mean, even, even our own uh, Kalasuri wore that dress at one point. That's true. <laughs> I, I think it was uh, a dare or he lost a bet or something like that. But, um, uh, yeah, but yeah, that we, was very there, funny. There's photographic evidence of it. Yeah, I've seen the, that. 
there was there was a long time where he didn't want that getting out uh, that he had done that, and then eventually, eventually he caved and allowed other people to start posting pictures of him in that outfit. Yeah, he he's definitely a good sport. <laughs> yeah, he is. He is. He's the best. Uh, let's see. Temple is saying. There are some cosplayers I follow on Facebook who struggle with doing what they want while trying to please others who have become fans of theirs. Now, mm. that's a that's an interesting uh, angle on that because there are there are cosplayers who have become celebrities in their own right uh, because because they do such good work and and I wonder like like because. It, it's one of those weird things where you do it because you love it, but then you become so popular with it that suddenly now you have fans who want certain things from you or who expect certain things from you. Yeah, I'm wondering what um, Temple means exactly. Like, yeah. do they have to to um, wear certain costumes or... I, I think it's... I think it's more a matter of like being available for photo shoots mm. or um, doing panels or just like talking to people. Like when you're a celebrity of of that nature, like people feel like they want or deserve um, a greater level of access to you. Right. Right. Well, Temple's saying well, Temple's that. saying also, yeah. yeah. Some sometimes they want to cosplay something different from what they're known for and some fans don't like that. And to that I say like you got to you got to go with uh, with your heart. You got to go with what you want to do cuz like I I feel like uh, as far as cosplaying goes if you got into this for the love of it then you got to stay true to that. Right. And yeah. not let somebody else tell you what you should be doing. Right. Like if you get known for cosplaying a certain character and then you show up in a completely different story, dressed as a character for a completely different story. Yeah. It, I mean, that happened to um, someone that I know who cosplays Tariel. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, Rose. Right? Rose at yeah. WonderCon. And then she showed up in some the, other character that I didn't even amazing know. amazing Poison Ivy cosplay. Oh, I saw that too. Yeah. But then another character that I had, didn't even know what the character was. And it's, it's very disconcerting because you're used to thinking her of her as Tariel. Yeah, I mean, her, her Tariel is really great. But then her Poison Ivy was amazing, too. And for me, I, I love to see the diversity of that skill. Like, okay, the Tariel costume is great, but you can also do this? That's unbelievable. Right. See, I, I think that, you know, that's what happens. A lot of cosplayers will get into cosplaying through like all right so they love the lord of the rings they love the costumes they want to do that and, and then they find out how interesting it is just to make the costume mm -hmm. and then they jump jump genre <laughs> yeah and so, i don't think there's anything wrong with that um, no, I'm, I'm sure there are fans out there who would disagree with me like once you do it then you're stuck with it well like, it's it's nobody only reads well, there are some people who only read Lord of the Rings, but most people there, there are. <laughs> are a little more diverse, so you don't yeah. just like Lord of the Rings. You may like... And, and even like J.W. was talking about that in his message. Like he, Not only does he love Lord of the Rings, he also loves Star Wars and Star Trek and Robotech and a bunch of other things. And like, I don't think, I don't think many of us are limited to just one fandom. No, and, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I... I I would find that to be rather isolating myself. Like, I mean, okay, I'm definitely much more involved in Tolkien fandom than any other one, but that's because I love the community. doesn't mean I don't love or don't watch anything else. I, I just uh, binge-watched uh, Daredevil this weekend, which was amazing. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, God, I loved it. I can't wait for uh, a season two. No, oh, I haven't watched Daredevil. I watch Arrow. <laughs> if you like Arrow, you'll like Daredevil. <laughs> um, let's see uh, everybody in the chat is talking about uh, this uh, guy uh, Joshua uh, Duart who uh, does a Thranduil cosplay and yep. how I and how I guess he's a uh, um, he's kind of been pigeonholed in that is, am I reading that right there's like a whole conversation going 
Yeah, that's what it seems like. There are a lot of Thranduil costumes. There, are, there are, and um, <laughs> I'm not familiar with uh, that name in particular, but I have a feeling. Um, I have a feeling I know who they're talking about because I have seen one or two Thranduil cosplayers who are really, really good, and I think uh, this guy may be one of them. Yeah, there, there's definitely some amazing Thranduils. And that, that's okay. another funny thing when you're somewhere and there's like four of the same character. <laughs> yeah. Well, Temple was saying, like, I think he said he wanted to cosplay as uh, Lady Tremaine from the recent uh, Cinderella, but a few people really want him to do more Thranduil. Mm. And, and it's like, to that I say, no, man, do Lady Tremaine. Like, yeah, I, I mean, if you, you know, once you've created the costume, there, you know, just to keep wearing it doesn't offer the challenge of creating another costume. Right, right. So, so yeah, it's... And, it's, and to me, like, I sort of feel like uh, costuming, part of it is the challenge of making something new. So, exactly. And once you've made something great, of course, yeah, you want to wear it and show it off, but... Famous um, Starbucks Thranduil picture with the girl freaking out behind him. I don't think I've seen that picture. I don't know. I think <laughs> I may have, but I don't remember it that well. Huh. Clearly, I'm not up on my cosplay. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to be coffee, sneezy, and snotty <laughs> through this whole show. And... Again, I apologize for that, everybody. You're not seeing me at my best. Um, but um, moving off of uh, cosplay to uh, the rest of the book, um, yep. like what I what I really like about uh, Middle Earth Madness um, is that it's really kind of like a cross section of um, basically what we do at the One Ring, because um, you've got. You've got uh, reviews of uh, the first two Hobbit movies, and what I like is that he juxtaposes them. Like, he has one that's going to... He, there's one review that is a very glowing review of the movie, and then he, right after that, he posts one. He, he puts up a review that is very negative and very critical of the movie. Right, it's like warring. Mm-hmm. Warring. But it's, it's uh, I, like... I wouldn't say it's warring. I think it's like more showing the uh, well, it's like the a diverse debate. opinions that we have. Because yeah. um, I know that, um, especially with uh, the Desolation of Smaug, um, I think it was Mike Urban who wrote the uh, the very negative review of it. Right, and Catherine wrote the positive. And Catherine wrote the very Arwen. glowing review of it. Um, right. And, um, and I know that uh, Mike Urban... Um, when he wrote that review originally, he didn't want to post it because he didn't want uh, any backlash. He didn't want fans yelling at him or he didn't want uh, torn staffers yelling at him. And I think a lot of us were like, no, write your review, post it. We need, I want to, we all want to see this diversity of opinion. Like if, right. you, if you didn't like the movie, say so. Don't be ashamed of that. I, I wrote when we did the, staff reviews right after the movie came out mm -hmm. I posted on the website I wrote a pretty somewhat scathing <laughs> I, review I think, of Desolation yeah. as well yeah I, I think mine was more <laughs> was more middle of the road um, but that's usually like how I go like I'm always one of those people who's like okay this is how I feel but I totally understand people who feel differently um, well, after rereading both their reviews, I, I think I would have, um, I was thinking about this, that I would have written, I, like, if I were to write the review now, it would be much more um, positive with, like, I'd look at things more in depth and say, this worked and this didn't, and yeah. not be all black or white. Yeah, and, like, that was sort of, like, my big takeaway from the trilogy as a whole, was that there are there are lots of things with it that work. There are also lots of things with it that don't work. And like, I'm of the opinion that I feel like the balance of that sort of, sort of hinges on, or the balance of that sort of, sort of comes out as uh, the stuff that didn't work for me kind of outweighs the stuff that did. But mm. 
that but that's my opinion i don't i don't dislike the movies i just uh like it, it, i almost want to say like when i like i'm speaking like a like a parent saying i'm not mad i'm just disappointed <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I thought the book did that was really interesting um, is in, not in the, the, those chapters where they're either for or against, but in some of the other chapters where it kind of analyzes perhaps why Peter did some of the things he did. Yeah, yeah. Like what was the reasoning behind it, um, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, like a lot of that, re I, I sort of felt like, some of the some of the explanation or reasoning like it it was more uh them it was more the reviewer trying like reading their own opinions into it um which i totally get um i don't i sort of don't feel like um until we until we hear it like directly from peter jackson i have a hard time believing that that's actually what his motivations were or I don't. I don't want to believe it. But I, I would rather hear it from him. I mean, right? Uh, I mean, Catherine gives some interesting insight for sure. Well, I, I was thinking more in the chapters um, where, not. I think I don't know whether J. W. wrote them, but um, where it kind of analyzes yeah was, each section. I wanted to get into that. Um, Bef yeah, before it goes into those like geeky observations and yeah, um, yeah. and I re I don't want <laughs> they always have the um, fool of a took mistakes and I'm, I'm always like hesitant to read them because I don't want to, every time I watch the movie to be thinking oh my god there's that mistake yeah well <laughs> part part of me like doesn't want that and then a part of me just sort of loves stuff like that like I mean they're there are technical mistakes all throughout Lord of the Rings, and I remember that there was a time uh, after the movies first came out when people were noticing this stuff, and a lot of people were saying, "Oh, Peter Jackson put that in intentionally so that people would find, so that there was something for people to notice." And a lot of us were like, "Yeah, not buying that." Right. Well, I I don't know. But, like you said, until we hear it from him, we just don't know. Yes, yeah. but uh. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about these uh, these breakdowns of uh, the first two movies because they are very uh, they're very interesting because um, they're uh, like it it's more than just like an analysis of the movie, sort of like bit by bit, like sort sort of going through the uh, story beats, and then it also goes into geeky observation which to me I, I sort of feel like it reads almost like um, almost like a torn commentary on the movie like you could read this along with the movie right which would be a lot of fun actually yeah it would be <laughs> <laughs> and so like that that's kind of why I'm like I, I would love for for all of us to go back and do another one so that we can do the same thing for uh, the Battle of the Five Armies yeah I think that it would be good and then just to to wrap now that we see it as a whole mm -hmm. and look can also look at all three movies in context with the three lord of the rings yeah. movies and, and just so. look back on like what the last few years have been like as a community right um but and uh, so some of the other stuff that's in the books is it bleh, some of the other stuff that's in this book are a lot of uh a lot of different interviews with a lot of different people. Um, Kirsten, uh, Green Dragon, who she couldn't be with us today. She's been on the show a couple times before. Uh, she did a whole bunch of interviews. Uh, she's got one with uh, Richard Armitage, uh, Graham McTavish, uh, Peter Hamilton, who played uh, Glowin, uh, Jed Brophy, who played uh, Nori, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Let me go to the chapter. Yep, Nori, I was right. Yay. And then we've also got uh, interviews that, um, that Cliff did with uh, Sylvester McCoy. Um, who, who did the one with Karen Shaw? 
Um, oh boy, where'd my book go? The one with Kieran Shaw was. Oh, that was JW who did that one. Yeah, Kieran. Kieran's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, he's been he's been in all of the movies, hasn't he? In some aspect or another. I think so. Yeah. And a, and a lot of other movies as well. I yeah. mean, and what what I learned in this article about him that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew he was like a double, but he he's actually a stunt person. That's his background. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so um, he's always trying to do like get, get them to let him do stunts and um, like you know like jumping off thirty five foot bridges <laughs> <laughs> and like thirty five feet into the water and. Um, <coughs> So I was really fascinated by that because I didn't know that. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I, and, didn't, I didn't know that either. Although, like, I don't know, part of me feels like I should have known that, but, like, it just sort of didn't enter my brain. Yeah. Just because and, I remember I watched uh, all, like, 13 hours of the appendices from uh, The Lord of the Rings uh, Extended Edition. <laughs> <laughs> like, that huge thing. And I know, like... I'm almost certain that they mentioned at some point that Karen Shaw was also a stunt person. They must well. have. I just don't remember them showing him doing it that much. That, there, that's probably true. Yeah. There, there was a little interesting tidbit where since he was only doubling, well, only, but he was doubling for Bilbo in The Hobbit, and um, he <laughs> wanted something else to do. He mm -hmm. wanted another character to do as well. So right. um, he said, well, Peter said, well, look in the books, and if you can find something, we'll let you do it. And so it was Kieran's idea to do the goblin scribe, okay. you know, the little guy in the basket who takes the notes. Right, yeah, yeah. And, um, and so he presented that to Peter, and Peter said, sure. And, um, and then he had to wear that prosthetic, or it was actually an animatronic head oh, that really? he had to wear. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so uh, Temple saying, if I met anyone from the movies, I'd be able to keep my cool, but not with Kieran Shaw. He's just so awesome. I don't even know why <laughs> I probably lose lose it, but the stories about him. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, you I, know, he he was e and he, he was like multiple Ewoks. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, oh. He, he was in Raiders of the Lost Ark, Narnia. Wow. Dark Crystal, Return of the Jedi. Oh my God, I mean, he's, he's been in everything. He's been in like 70 movies. Wow. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I mean, I knew he had like a, a track record, even like when he first started in Lord of the Rings. I didn't realize it was that diverse and that momentous. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I was very like interested that, to learn like that. That makes him like pretty much an icon, like uh, having uh, Bob Anderson as the Swordmaster on uh, Lord of the Rings. Right. Like you don't get like you don't get much more iconic than that. Right. But but I guess the issue, you know, the reason we don't know it is a lot of times he, he's not recognizable of, as himself. So uh Temple was asking, wasn't he wicked? Actually, no, Warwick Davis was wicked. He said um Kieran said his favorite role was in um Narnia, when he got to play um, Ginnarbrick, the character. Oh, oh, uh, oh, God, yeah. Um, because I guess you get, that was his favorite character, I don't know why, but that's what he said. Okay, cool. And you got to see more of him. Yeah. So. Oh, it, it's funny, like, uh, going back to uh, the Narnia movies, because, like, even... It's like Peter Dinklage was in Prince Caspian before, like anybody really knew who he was. I might have to go back and watch that. I don't remember him in there. Yeah, he plays a uh, Trumpkin. Wow. Definitely have to go back and watch it. Yeah. <laughs> like it, he has such a distinctive voice. Like you'll recognize him like right away. Right. Like even though he's in very heavy makeup, but um, yeah, you'll. It, it's just funny, like, watching... I still haven't seen uh, Dawn Treader. I'm a bad Narnia fan. <laughs> but uh, but in Caspian, like, uh, Dinklage is in that. Uh, 
Um, I guess uh, Karen would have been in that one as well, because I think that's where that character is from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, uh, Aravandi saying he was the White Witch's dwarf sidekick in Narnia. Don't know how to spell the name, though. Yep. So, um, yeah, like, Kieran Shaw is a very fascinating uh, person. So, like, it was really great that uh, JW got to interview him for this. And, um, and he also uh, interviewed uh, uh, Mark Ordesky. And uh, I think Daniel Falconer was him. Let me check. I always have to double check the bylines because there's so many, like, authors and co authors in this. Right. Uh, yes, he also did a QA with uh, Daniel uh, Falconer. Um, and and the, unfortunately, I haven't gotten to those two uh, Q and A's yet. Um, I would imagine both of them have a lot of things to say. Um, I I thought the interviews, um, like contrasting Richard Armitage's interview with Graham McTavish's, was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because they have such different styles of how they approach acting. Yeah, they really do. Like, I mean. Well, Richard Armitage is more classic theater, and Graham McTavish is not. <laughs> I guess that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, and um, I'm trying to remember some of the quotes. But, but um, like, Graham was like, it's all about the script. It's like mm -hmm. the words on the page are what make the character. Mm -hmm. And you just go in and you that's you read the words and you act the part that the words are giving you yeah and he he's he doesn't take any backstory with him um i thought that was kind of interesting yeah, and then that, that is very interesting um because i it obviously works because uh, i would i still say like the the scene between uh him and richard in a uh, battle of the five armies um in the throne room when right when they're like basically confronting each other um, about everything that's going on is one of the most unbelievably superbly acted scenes in the entire trilogy, in my opinion. I, I thought it was great. I, I thought Richard Armitage's performance in the Battle of Five Armies was just amazing. Yeah. And I don't think he got nearly the credit he, he deserved for it. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely agree. I would say, like, there are a lot of people in the Hobbit movies throughout who didn't get enough credit for their performances as they probably should have. Like, uh, Richard Armitage is definitely one. Um, Martin Freeman, for sure. Right. Um, and Benedict Cumberbatch, like, I thought his Smaug was one of the, one of the most amazing dragon performances I've ever seen. Right. No, for sure. And, and Ian Not that McCallan. there are a lot of dragon performances out there, but, um, I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch, like, really brought, like, a sense of, like, real terror and gravitas to that role. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, there's just not enough recognition for the motion capture I mean, yeah. Andy Serkis finally, he won, just recently won an award for his role as Caesar. Oh, really? But, yeah. Um, but that's like the, out of all the things he's done, that's the first like major award he's won. Huh. And I, I, I just think you need to add that category because more and more it, yeah. it's being done like that. Well, it's like, the. Well, what's happening now with the uh, motion capture, I feel, is that we're sort of um, dealing with um, the the old world, old school type thought, which sort of doesn't see it as as genuine a performance. Uh, the same thing happened uh, back in the eighties in uh, special effects, um, this with a uh, Tron, because uh, uh, Tron was one of the first movies to. Uh, 
utilize uh, computer graphics as part of its uh, visual effects. And the Academy actually denied nominating it for Best Visual Effects because it felt at, they felt at the time that computer graphics were cheating. <laughs> and you see how far we've come since then. Right. And so I sort of feel like it's really only just a matter of time before we turn that corner with the motion capture and start seeing it for the good performance that it really can be. Right. I think if, if like the screeners were given, because even actors these days are mostly working against green screen. Yeah. So it's a solo performance. And I think if screeners were given like a split screen um, to watch where you would see the actor in the mocap mm -hmm. and then the final version, mm -hmm. and that's what they watched instead of just watching the movie, yeah. that... Um, there might be more nominations for those actors. I, I would think so, because I think, I think like one of the more eye-opening ones that I've seen was um, of Benedict Cumberbatch uh, when he was right. performing Smaug and how he's like really just writhing around on this, uh, on this green screen set. Right, he's on like the floor on the mat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like to be able to do that, like basically sort of transform yourself into some sort of reptilian creature while giving a performance is a major, major feat. And yeah. I think like if he were to do that in costume on stage, they would give him all the awards. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's definitely overlooked. Mm -hmm. So. But I, I feel like fairly soon we're going to turn that corner and um, I, I, Do, I believe it was Andy Serkis who wanted to change it from motion capture to a performance capture. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very uh, smart move. And I think, uh, I think that in the next few years, we're finally going to turn that corner and it's going to get the uh, legitimacy it deserves. Do, do you think it should be a separate category or... Do you think it should just be like best actor or best supporting actor? I kind of want it to fall under the acting category just because I sort of feel like making it its own separate category um, diminishes it in some way. Like uh, like how they do uh, how they how they do best animating picture along along with the uh, best picture, which stemmed. Truly, because Beauty and the Beast got nominated for Best Picture one year, and there were a lot of, uh, or there were a lot of old guard people in the Academy who felt like that was a travesty, right? And and they sort of felt like, well, we want to recognize these fantastic animated movies that are coming out, but we don't want them clogging up the legitimate movies. So they created Best Animated Feature, right? I guess I guess I you know I'd like to see like Andy win in the you know best actor category because that's what he too. deserves. But at the same time, if they had a separate category, more of these pe these pe actors who are doing the motion capture would get recognized. I think, and and then it would become more you know people would be used to thinking about it that way, and then maybe you can merge it back. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And, uh, and Temple's uh, saying, I think there's a difference between mocap and performance cap. When, when it's more acting related, it should definitely be seen as performance capture. But if it's more for computer modeling, it should be motion capture. And I, I absolutely agree with that, Temple. There is a, there is a difference um, and there is a place for motion capture and performance capture. Um, I think the point that uh, Andy Serkis was making that was that he was doing this like incredible work and calling it motion capture like in the same way we were talking about of creating a separate category in the Academy Awards for it uh, diminishes it and and so I, I feel like that distinction should be made but at the same time and it, it seems very weird because it seems almost like I'm contradicting myself like you should make this distinction here but not here. Um, but, um,
because motion capture is an essential element, especially when it comes to uh, video gaming. Um, but yeah. I think even if you called it the only performance capture, I mean, if it was just capture to make some orcs running down the hill, I mean, that would never get nominated anyhow. Yeah. So it would only be the outstanding performances that would right. get nominated. Right. Like when, when you got people who are capturing motions for like member of an orc army or member of an elf army, um, uh, and but then you have the uh, the people who are like doing these individual performances. And uh, Ava's saying, I kind of don't care about all this Oscar stuff and awards. I know it's important for the industry, but it feels so elitist to me. Um, and while I do agree with that, like I'm definitely not a fan of um, of the Oscars in general. I usually don't care, but at the same time, there is a lot of clout um, that is given to winners, and I sort of feel like there are there are people. There are people who deserve that amount of clout and respect who aren't getting it, and that that's sort of where it, what it comes down to for me. Like, I mean, do I care um, about the award itself? Not particularly. What I care about is the respect from the industry that comes with it. Right. Um, and not not just the industry, but also uh, the public at large, um, because there is there is a certain uh, level of higher respect that an Oscar winner will get publicly than other than other people would. Do you think that just being a nominee has that same impact? It can. It definitely can. Um, and uh, Temple saying there's a lot of politics behind the Oscars. I don't give them much credit. Um, and and that's true too, Temple. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, it's so, it's, a, it's a very weird line. And I mean, of course, the Hobbit movies didn't get much at all in the way of uh, Oscars uh, right. wins or nominations. Which, yeah, I think is a travesty, <laughs> especially I, in the yeah, costuming yeah. department. Definitely I'm... in the costuming department. Uh, there were there were certainly aspects of um, the visual effects that I uh, that I felt didn't quite live up to uh, what was established with Lord of the Rings. Um, of course, this is just my my opinion on it, but I sort of feel like. There was too much reliance on new bells and whistles uh, with the Hobbit trilogy, as far as uh, the high frame rate and the 3D was concerned. Um, that I felt it sort of served as more of a distraction. Um, but that's just me. I know plenty of people who were totally okay with that. Right. I, I just. I mean, again, it's you know, my thing for costumes, I felt they really got overlooked. Um, oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the costumes were amazing. And even if they, people were like, oh, you know, we've seen this all in Lord of the Rings. It, it's like they didn't really look, you know, they just were pre-prejudiced mm -hmm. against it because the, the dwarf costumes were amazing and the hairstyles and to be able to, to keep them all separate and distinct like that. I mean, yeah. it, it was like, incredible. I, I, was, I, I agree, and I've always been very impressed by the fact that um, they were able to take these 13 characters and make them all distinctive enough that you were able to remember who they were on site. Right. Um, but, um, and I also know other people who didn't like the fact that they were so distinctive. Like, because you, that it's so di different from the way the book was. I guess, like, um, I I think like uh, like one of my friends uh, didn't like the fact that they were so individually distinctive as opposed to like just keeping it simple. Like they would wear a different colored hat, like in um, in the Rack and Bass movie. Like 
Like you knew well, who the various groups of the dwarves were. Yeah, I, I don't agree. I mean, that's the way it is in the either. book that he just talks about the different color hoods. Yeah. But um, I think when you're watching them on screen, you have to give them all distinct personalities. Yeah. And even as it was, like, many of them didn't get many lines at all. Yeah, but, then, uh, like Bomber, uh, Stephen Hunter, he doesn't have a single spoken line in all three movies. Which is just ridiculous. Yeah, he, so I, he didn't have I, one in the Battle of Five Armies either? No. I'm ridiculous, yeah. but but still, by his character, he had so much personality that you don't feel that, right? You know, because he had stunt gags and just mm -hmm. just the way he looked was enough to make you remember him. Yeah, no, so I absolutely agree. Um, so we've been talking a lot about the movies and not so much about uh, the book, um, but like I was saying, like there's a there are lots of various uh, various elements in this book that I feel like sort of create a really a really nice like overview of uh, how we uh, how we operate at uh, the One Ring, um, like, and there are lots of stuff that like I haven't even mentioned yet, like uh, um, the fact that uh, Kelly Rice has a chapter in here about uh, the history of uh, the Hobbitception uh, viral video. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed reading that because yeah. um, I, I think, um, you know, there, there were um, some haters, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, and she really, it came from the heart, what she wrote, and she really yeah. said, you know, we had no idea that this was going to happen yeah. and, and that they were completely blown away by it. And um, it kind of you know, rocketed them to even more widespread fame right? And, because of it. And like, and one of the things that I told Kelly like right away after it happened was like, I, I, had, I had told her like when they first started Happy Hobbit, something is going to happen at some point that is going to rocket you guys to stardom because you're just, you're too talented and you're too fun. And one of these days you're going to do something that everybody's going to latch on to. And, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and sure enough, Hobbitception is exactly what happened. Um, and but I mean, it was also like their their trailer reaction video was also done as like like a quick thing um, because because they had stuff to do that day. And I think it's like interesting uh, to see like they just threw this together quickly. Uh, just to get something out there because they had stuff to do that day and they knew right. that um, uh, they knew that everybody else was going to be reacting to the trailer throughout the day. So like, okay, let's just shoot this video and send it to a uh, torn and and put it up on our channel and that'll be our reaction to it. And right, I guess. And when um, Kelly got a text or an email saying that. Um, she had so many hits on it or something that she didn't even believe it. Mm -hmm. She just thought they were joking with her. <laughs> yeah. So I think it was, uh, I think it was Peter Jackson's daughter who, it, who was a fan of uh, happy Hollywood already saw the reaction video and sent it to him. And okay. then he, and then he retweeted it saying like, Oh, this is fun. No, I hadn't heard that. It, it was his daughter that did that. I, I, I believe it was uh, his daughter, at least uh, from what they've told me in the past. Um, um, cause I do know that, um, his daughter is a big, uh, happy Hobbit fan and just seeing the way that she acted with uh, the two of them on the, uh, on the red carpet or the black carpet at uh, the battle of the five armies premiere. Uh -huh. Like she was acting like they were old friends and this was apparently like the first time they'd ever actually met. <laughs> It was really adorable. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but, but then of course, like the big thing that happened then was Peter Jackson then had a bunch of the cast react to the reaction and posted that online, and and then that's what really went viral. Right, and well, and then and it was then it was Kelly 
<laughs> Alex's reaction to watching that. And I, and I guess, according to the book, they really struggled with whether to post that. They hadn't intended to post that second part of it. Yeah. And they had to talk to Chris per Perota and, and really um, consult with him about whether he thought they should post it or not. Yeah. And are you talking about, like, their second reaction video? Yeah, their reaction to Orlando and yeah. Evie watching. Yeah, and, and I remember, <laughs> uh, like, yeah, Kelly had a, she was talking with uh, Chris and she had a, she had texted me a bit uh, about whether or not uh, she wanted to, whether or not she should post that, like a second reaction video. And my response was, you absolutely should. It's too hilarious not to. Right. right. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, I think like it took everybody by surprise. And that's, that's one of the things that I love about uh, the internet in general. It's like, you never know what somebody's going to latch on to that's going to like propel you into stardom. And I mean, I love, I love happy Hobbit, like right from the get go. Um, so, so seeing, seeing them like suddenly get propelled into this upper echelon of internet stardom just sort of made me feel sort of vindicated in a little way. Like, like, yep, I was right. These girls are amazing, and now the rest of the world knows it. Yep. Um, uh, so, what is Temple saying? Those videos made me giggle so much. I'm glad they did post it. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, it's a it's a cute story. And then, of course, there is the uh, the blowback of people once it become once it becomes popular. You have the people, the detractors, saying, like, oh, well, this was all fake and this was just for the hits. Right. And I, I don't think it was. I mean, I, no, I, it I, I, mean, I know it was wasn't. Not. They, yeah. just, they just reacted and because yeah. that's the way they are. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I, will, I will confront anybody who says that they were faking it and say, listen, I know these girls personally and I know how excitable they are. Those are genuine reactions right there. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what made it so funny. Yeah, like if if it had been, if it had been fake, you'd have known it. Like, right. Like, um, and Kelly has even like said like in in the early days of uh, Happy Hobbit, they tried uh, scripting out uh, what they were going to talk about, and um, it was very difficult for them because uh, when they were reading from a script it felt very stilted to them and it did look very stilted as well. And so when they started doing more off the cuff stuff, then it became a lot more fun. Right. And, and so like you can see that and say like, no, th this is what it looks like when they're acting. <laughs> this is what it looks like when they're genuine. <laughs> I, I just remember Alex with the tissue in her hand. And I mean, it was, it was just so obvious that they were just freaking out. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, and freaking out in the way only they can. <laughs> right. Right. So. And, so and, uh, no, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say another thing that I I really like in the interviews is um like finding out like tidbits that <coughs> um you wouldn't normally hear about like Graham Matavish naming his swords. I mean his axes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, after Emily Bronte's dogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, like, why he did that and why he was a fan of that. And, um, I mean, there's just there's just a lot of really yeah. interesting um, there, there's things. All, there's some great insight here. Like, I, there was some stuff in uh, the interview with Richard Armitage that I found really fascinating. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, And just then yeah. each each chapter that breaks down um, the different parts of the movie, all the geeky observations um, that um, are we've come up with that you know you watch the movie and you don't necessarily catch it, but then when you 
have it spelled out to you, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Or then you're going to go back and watch it and go, you know, oh, my God, look at that now yeah. that you know about it. So Yeah, yeah. there's definitely that. And that I, I can't find um, where the insight that oh, – it, it had to do with um, – with Thorin uh, turning Bard away in um, in Battle of the Five Armies, I think. Um, and Richard Armitage like said that he had he struggled with uh, with how to perform that scene because it was uh, he, he felt it was not something that Thorin's character would do, and so he like. So it was really sort of like really uh, building up that whole uh, dragon sickness thing, because to Richard Armitage, he sort of felt like um, turning turning away Bard, who was coming to him with a legitimate request, um, was not something that Thorin would do had he not been corrupted by something. I, I thought it was interesting. Uh, one of the things that I didn't know that he talked about was how he he kind of like Vigo felt the need to really stay in character. Yeah. And so he would spend a lot of time like facing the wall in the corner yeah. because he w didn't want to lo lose the thread of his character yeah. for the scene. And I, I hadn't had to imagined. Be really him. awkward for everybody else on set. <laughs> yeah. Especially, like I said, Graham doesn't act like that at all. Mm -hmm. That's not his style <laughs> yeah no he's, he's so, definitely one of those guys like as soon as the camera stops rolling he's back to being Graham right so I just I thought that was really interesting yeah. so yeah there's a lot of good stuff in here yeah so um we're we're a little bit past uh, an hour on the show so I'd like to uh, wrap things up um but I think um Middle Earth Madness is a really good uh really good look into the the hive mind of uh, the one ring um and i there there are lots of things unfortunately that we didn't get into like uh, the world building chapter um that uh kristen thompson uh wrote which is actually a chapter from her book uh, the frodo franchise um or uh, all the look back looking backs on um the various Lord of the Rings, uh, the Lord of the Rings, the Bakshi movies, uh, the Rankin no, Bass movies. Yeah, you should have Cliff on when you talk about that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's he's a uh, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to um, expose yep. anything. <laughs> yeah. No, there, there's a lot in here. There really is. Yeah, and there there's some great discussions, and I do hope that. Um, that at some point we can uh, come together and do a follow-up book that sort of um, the sort of just gives an overview of everything that uh, went on with the uh, with the community for the last few years. Because like as much as I am loath to admit it, um, there is going to be some drop-off in the community from now on going forward, just because um, after the extended Battle of the Five Armies comes out, there's not going to be anything new to talk about. Maybe we could do some speculation on what other movies could be made. Oh, oh God. <laughs> I've, I've been planning this whole thing out. I figure, you know what, we got about 30 years until we could probably legitimately do a Silmarillion movie series. Uh, Cause that's, that's about when, um, when it goes public domain. So I'm like, okay, Let's start plotting this out now. Let's start writing this out now. So you know, at at WonderCon, I can't remember who was, when they did the panel, and um, they were saying, um, I forget what they were talking about. But then I started thinking, well, there could be a whole movie about Balin going to retake Moria, right? There could. I mean, there <laughs> there's very little that Tolkien wrote about that particular uh, event. Right, so it can all be made. <laughs> the the problem is, we all know that it ends tragically. So, <laughs> I I don't know. I, I kind of want to. I kind of want something with a happy ending. Of course, 
The same can be said for anything in the Silmarillion. Yeah, there are very I, few things in the Silmarillion <laughs> that end happily. This is true. <laughs> but it's, you know, it, it goes, it's made for good drama getting there. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's very much about like uh, what you can, what you can get away with, right? Um, but at the same time, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, like the, I, I definitely want to talk to uh, everybody about like panels at conventions going forward, talking more about the future of Middle Earth films, right? Because it there's gonna be a future. We don't know how it's going to manifest or when it's going to manifest, but it is going to happen at some point. Right. And even, and even fan films. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I, I um, backed um, one recently that's mm -hmm. getting made. And, oh, yeah? Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I don't think it will ever be uh, completely let go as far as making no. films about Middle Earth. Well, it, it's it's too big a franchise for Warner to just leave it be. Right. Like, I mean, they're even going back to the well with Harry Potter. So. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we'll we'll see what the future holds. Um, so, thank you, Nancy, for uh, being on uh, the program uh, this week. Yeah, uh, thanks. Again, again, I apologize, to everybody, for um, all the uh, illness going around. Uh, my congestion. Uh, I know Nancy is uh, feeling under the weather as well. <laughs> um, so, um, <coughs> so we'll we'll leave that at that. And um, next week, hopefully, I'll be feeling better, and we'll be getting back into um, the Silmarillion. Uh, and I believe uh, Button Lady will be uh, joining us again as we. Uh, go into uh, the War of the Jewels uh, with uh, Feanor and all of that wonderful stuff. Like, what I like, I kind of call it, like, the first, like, really big story of uh, the Silmarillion. So, so thank you, Nancy, and thank you, everybody in the chat. Um, I'm going to go medicate myself for a little <laughs> while. <laughs> uh, you do the same. <laughs> And all right. I will see you all next week. All right. Thanks, stop. Josh. Thank you. And never stop reading. <laughs>